In the years since it left the air, it's become a bit of a cliché to criticize The Big Bang Theory. What was once among the most popular shows in America is now a bit of a joke. Its cultural moment has passed. It's no longer quite as relevant to the zeitgeist. Or so you'd think. You see... Even before The Big Bang Theory ended its 12-year run, the show's spin-off series began. Young Sheldon, which sounds like the title you'd use if you were going to invent a Big Bang Theory prequel as a joke, is now in its sixth season, with over 110 episodes under its belt. And it's... well, it's not bad. Oh no, if it were just bad, I would make a video about it. No, Young Sheldon is weird. Insanely weird. Like, it might be the most bizarre television series that's currently airing. If you've never seen Young Sheldon, please let me introduce this show to you, because it is amazing. And if you are a dyed-in-the-wool Sheldon head, we need to talk. But first, one, what is Young Sheldon? On The Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper was a cartoonish caricature of a nerd, an absolute jerk who lacked almost any empathy, who obsessed over fictional pop culture characters at the expense of his real-life relationships, and who was happy to alienate anyone he came into contact with as long as he got what he wanted, even if what he wanted was something as ridiculous as his favorite spot on the sofa. In short, he was terrible. And... That was the point of him. Sheldon was the foil, the obstacle, the character you're meant to laugh at, not identify with. He was the dork, uh, kind of like Dwight Schrute or Steve Urkel. And yet, as the series went on and eventually passed the 200 episode mark, Sheldon became, well, not softer, but more familiar and consequently more empathetic. Well, much like Dwight Schrute and Steve Urkel, come to think of it. He gained a family, a mother played by Laurie Metcalf, a sister, a brother, a girlfriend, and later a wife. He went from being the butt of the jokes to being a lovable goof, the guy who was annoying but who you kinda sided with. He was still the world's worst roommate, but you kind of ended up liking him as he tortured the other characters with his annoying habits. Into this context, we come to young Sheldon. Set during Sheldon Cooper's childhood and preteen years, it's actually a really, really smart idea for a show. It's your classic fish-out-of-water story, sticking a genius child prodigy in a rural, conservative, religiously-minded Texas town surrounded by people who don't understand him. It's got a lot of comedic and dramatic potential. And that's how the show started. I mean, I watched Young Sheldon every single episode, and it starts out insanely normal. You've got Sheldon, his more normal twin sister Missy, his goofball older brother Georgie, the football coach father George, who's more interested in sports than science, and the religiously devout mother Mary, who worries about her nine-year-old atheist son. And I haven't even told you the best part. Young Sheldon's got a grandmother named Connie, a fun, laid-back Texas woman with a quick wit and sarcastic sense of humor, played by none other than Annie Potts, and honestly, who wouldn't watch this thing? Unfortunately, all that stuff I just described, yeah, none of it is true. Or rather, it was true when the show started, but after six seasons, the show has changed almost entirely, transformed into something unrecognizable. I'd like to describe to you what Young Sheldon is really about now after five years because it is bananas. 2. Young Sheldon Today First of all, Young Sheldon isn't young. He's 12, and the kid playing him is 14. Uh, that goofball older brother? Well, he's now 17, but he lied about his age in order to have sex with a 29-year-old woman who then became pregnant out of wedlock, which caused Sheldon's mother's church to ostracize the family, which caused Sheldon's mom to lose her faith in God and contemplate having an affair with the church's sexy new pastor. 
Speaking of affairs, which we inexplicably were in a video about a show called Young Sheldon, Sheldon's father George is inching towards having an affair of his own with the family's neighbor, a woman whose husband left her and her young son after the actor playing him got a better gig and left the show. So, two extramarital affairs, an underage minor using false pretenses to impregnate a woman who's 12 years older than him, and a crisis of faith. But what about that wacky grandma? Well, she's running an underground casino. So... Um... Yeah, okay. Uh, sure. Oh, and Sheldon's twin sister Missy is also there. They don't give her a lot to do, which is probably for the best, since I would genuinely worry about what nonsense they'd write for her. It's probably for the best that she mostly stands off to the side and makes the occasional wisecrack. The show, in other words, is broken. What was once a very clean, crisp, easily explainable concept is now a bananas mess about unplanned pregnancies, infidelity, illegal gambling, losing faith in God, and did I mention that Sheldon's father is going to die of a heart attack? Oh, uh, spoiler alert, but at some point in The Big Bang Theory, a character mentions that Sheldon's dad died of a heart attack when Sheldon was 14. So that has to happen because we sure don't want to disrupt continuity, and if it seemed weird that a 14-year-old actor was stuck playing 12, I'm pretty sure this is the reason why, because the second that character turns 14, we have to kill his father. What is this show? You see why it fascinates me, right? And I didn't even get into Sheldon's grandmother's multiple love interests. You see, Wallace Shawn, Ed Begley Jr., and Craig T. Nelson all play former-slash-current lovers of Sheldon's grandmother, plus Reba McIntyre is there as the ex-wife of one of them, and they all just pop in every third episode or so, with Sheldon's grandmother's love life sometimes taking up the majority of an episode's runtime. Now, I'm not saying that none of these topics or storylines belongs in a silly sitcom. That's not true, but I just feel like they don't all belong in the same sitcom, especially when that sitcom is about a nerdy child growing up in rural Texas to a family that doesn't quite understand him, because at this point, very, very little of young Sheldon is actually about Sheldon. And in many, if not most recent episodes, the character of Sheldon is sidelined nearly entirely, shoved off into a B or even a C plot so that we can spend the majority of our time watching his older brother prepare for impending teenage fatherhood, watching his parents work on their relationship issues, and watching his grandmother smuggle video poker machines across state lines with her ex-boyfriend. How did this happen? This is the question that fascinates me, and it's the question that I think is worth examining. And so, I'd like to take one episode from each of young Sheldon's first few seasons and unravel how the show changed, why it changed, and what prompted its original premise to become so unfathomably twisted, because it all started out so promising. 3. Early Young Sheldon there is something warmly pleasing about a properly told sitcom story. It's like a familiar song. There's a poetry to it. Uh, just as an example, consider Season 1, Episode 5 of Young Sheldon. In this episode, Sheldon uses his mathematical abilities to help his father, a high school football coach, win more games by using data analytics. As a result, he and his father grow closer over what has unexpectedly become a shared interest in football. Meanwhile, Sheldon's older brother, who plays on his father's football team, becomes jealous of this newfound bond between his father and Sheldon. At the same time, Sheldon becomes popular at school, something he doesn't enjoy, but something that his best friend uses for his advantage. And in the show's C-plot, Sheldon's grandmother tries to use Sheldon's analytical abilities to gamble. Ultimately, Sheldon stands up to the people who have been using him for their own advantage and who haven't cared about whether or not Sheldon is happy. Shakespeare this episode ain't, but I like it a lot. 
It looks to its premise, a genius kid living in Texas finds an interesting way to exploit it, having the kid use his intelligence to improve a football team, and it invents a scenario that involves nearly every member of the cast in a major capacity, where every aspect of the plot is connected. The A story of Sheldon working with his father is connected to the B story of Sheldon's friend gaining popularity, is connected to the C plot of Sheldon's grandmother's gambling, is connected to the D plot of Sheldon's brother feeling abandoned. And considering that this episode is only 19 minutes long, including theme song and end credits, the show isn't overstuffed with plot. It has exactly the right amount. Season 2 of Young Sheldon, though, is rarely this narratively tidy. In a typical example, the season's eighth episode, the main plot involves Sheldon and his grandmother becoming addicted to a video game, which ends with the two of them completing the video game. No real conflict there to solve, just things happen, and then they stop happening. And in the B-plot, Sheldon's brother is revealed to be a car-fixing savant and gets a job at a local garage. And, well, uh, that's that. There's some brief conflict when Sheldon's grandmother plays the video game without him, and when Sheldon's brother quits his father's football team to focus on the garage. But these problems aren't so much solved as they are just moved past. And it's worth pointing out that Georgie's savant-level mechanical aptitude is very quickly abandoned by the show, as is Sheldon's video game bonding with his grandmother. And the fact that these two plots have nothing to do with one another also means there's a lack of thematic unity to this episode that wasn't there in season one. It also means that a full half of this episode has nothing at all to do with the character of Sheldon or the genius kid in Texas premise of the show. Which leads us to season three, where the signs of strain really start to show even more. In the season's seventh episode, Sheldon's sister Missy joins an all-boys baseball team coached by Sheldon's grandmother's ex-boyfriend, who goes out for drinks with Sheldon's father, much to Sheldon's grandmother's consternation. Missy then struggles with bullies who are picking on her for being on a baseball team, and, well, that's the plot. Oh, and uh, also Sheldon gets an internet modem and argues with somebody on the internet about science? Because you've got to include the show's titular character at least a little bit, right? Hmm. I guess you could argue that the stories in this episode all have something to do with fighting, maybe? I guess, I don't know, it's kind of a thematic mess. Uh, meanwhile, there's also a season-long subplot happening about Sheldon's grandma dating different guys, and I really don't know what to make of any of this. But at the end of the day, all of this is just sloppy storytelling, right? Mm, well, it gets worse. Much worse. 4. The Downfall of Young Sheldon in season four, Sheldon goes off to college, and you can sort of feel this opening up a whole new world of possibilities for the show's writers. You get the sense that they know that they've exhausted all the stories they can think of related to the show's original premise, and so now we get new characters like the grumpy dean and the persnickety professor. We get conflicts involving navigating a university environment and trying to solve physics problems. But because Sheldon has now become geographically removed from the rest of the cast, they all start to go off and do their own things entirely, even more than they already were. In the season's 10th episode, Sheldon deals with being a lowly lab assistant in college, while Sheldon's brother makes an exercise video with a local drama teacher played by Jason Alexander, and Sheldon's grandmother becomes an investor. Just... Random insanity happening. Oh, and also David Hasselhoff is there for reasons? Who's ready to rustle up some muscles? <laughs> Let's saddle up and ride. 
Given this space to grow, many of the plots involving the non-Sheldon characters begin to expand into season-long arcs, or more accurately, series-long arcs. Uh, Sheldon's mother grows dissatisfied with her role as a housewife and her marriage to her husband and begins to fantasize about cheating on him with the new youthful pastor. Meanwhile, she gets a job at a bowling alley working with the woman who her husband is planning to have an affair with. Meanwhile, Sheldon's father is fired from his job as a football coach, enters a prolonged period of unemployment, and eventually goes to work at the sporting goods store owned by one of Sheldon's grandmother's multiple ex-boyfriends. Sheldon's brother, meanwhile, used to work at that same store until he was fired and is now dealing with the problems resulting from him having sex with a woman who is roughly 12 years his senior and becoming an underage father who lives in a garage. <sighs> at this point, the show is almost entirely disinterested in Sheldon as a character. Uh, the character is often shunted aside, and if it weren't for the narration of old Sheldon, you'd be forgiven for thinking of Sheldon as a wacky side character in the sitcom. It's inarguable that the show's writers are just way, way more interested in the exploits of Mima, Georgie, Mary, and George than they are about this little genius kid whose name is in the title of the show. And that leads us to talking about this. 5. Unhealthy Transformation both The Big Bang Theory and Young Sheldon were created by Chuck Lorre, an incredibly prolific producer, writer, and director who also made a short-lived show called Be Positive. Uh, this was the story of a divorced man named Drew who suddenly finds himself in need of a new kidney. That's when he meets Gina, a fun but flaky woman whose blood type matches him. This unlikely pair grow closer, moving in together, bonding, and helping one another solve various life problems. And then, in season two, Gina inherits $24 million, buys a nursing home, and now that's the show. We get new side characters who live at Gina's nursing home, all kinds of kooky antics occur, and eventually this show was cancelled 16 episodes later, ending on a cliffhanger. Here again is a show with a very tight, very specific, very clever premise that it gets bored with almost immediately and tosses aside to focus its attention on seemingly anything else. This is the story of young Sheldon in a nutshell. A nut Sheldon. Hmm. In the third episode of Young Sheldon's fifth season, Sheldon's brother drops out of school and he gets kicked out of the house. He gets a second job to support himself, and that's the plot. Oh, meanwhile, the physics professor played by Wallace Shawn and the physics professor played by Ed Begley Jr. argue about something. I mean, what even are we doing here? <laughs> Lollipop, lollipop, ooh, lolly, lollipop, 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 ooh, lolly, lollipop, 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 ooh, lolly, 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 lollipop. The initial concept of the show, the reason why fans showed up, the reason why the show was greenlit in the first place, is gone. We are watching Young Sheldon in name only. This is now the Cooper family show with special guest stars Sheldon's grandmother's lovers. But why does this matter? Why does any of this matter? Well, because Young Sheldon is still one of the most popular shows on television, and unlike Be Positive, this show isn't getting cancelled anytime soon. And if this many people are tuning in week after week to watch a show that seems so very, very broken, then, well, maybe... I'm wrong about it. Like, I think this show is a hot mess. But is it? 6. Why Young Sheldon is Genius We know what happens when a Chuck Lorre show switches premises halfway through its production. It's painful, it's weird, and it doesn't work. But I've got a theory that this was not what was happening to young Sheldon. In fact, I put it to you that young Sheldon was a trick. 
Uh, that neat little premise that we had way back in season one, that was a Trojan horse that Chuck Lorre used to smuggle in something completely different. I theorized that he was never all that interested in watching the exploits of a precocious kid genius, but was instead interested in creating an ensemble comedy that could last for seven, maybe eight, potentially nine or ten seasons. He sold the show both to the network and to the audience on its connection to the Big Bang Theory and the reappearance of its most popular character as a child in the 80s. But none of that really mattered in the end, because young Sheldon is not about Sheldon. In fact, it's not about anything. Uh, certainly, it's not about stories. I mean, Georgie stopped working at that garage almost as soon as he started, Missy hasn't had an interest in sports in years, and I can pretty much guarantee that the plot lines that the show is currently enamored with will similarly drift away without ceremony. But in that way, young Sheldon ends up doing something kind of remarkable. Remember that season one episode about Sheldon doing data analytics for the school's football team? Remember how wonderfully neat and tidy that episode was? How very pleasing it was to watch? Well, life isn't like that. Life is sloppy and messy and weird and full of tangents and random stuff that seems to matter in the moment but doesn't lead to anything huge. In storytelling, and in television specifically, I think that high-concept ideas are often easier to get people hooked on, but young Sheldon demonstrates that this kind of storytelling isn't the be-all and end-all of sitcom formats. I don't want to call Sheldon a bold experiment and a radical reinvention of the sitcom, but it is fascinating to see how much this show has transformed and how it has managed to maintain a devoted audience through that transformation. Is young Sheldon weird? Absolutely. Is it bad? I don't think so. Uh, at the very least, it is, I think, a fairly interesting artifact to ponder, one that teaches us the lesson that even a show that you might initially dismiss may be a little smarter and a little better than you think. Well, at least that's my two cents. What side do you come down on it? Is Young Sheldon a bold work of genius, or is it a hacky sitcom that's outlived its usefulness? I'm actually really interested in what you have to say, and if you liked this video, here are some more that I made and that I also think you'll enjoy. Please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to see more of this, and I hope to see you again next time. Bye!